Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, your weekly discussion of news events from the editors of your very favorite Libertarian magazine. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, and in a return to form after last week's uh, historic crossover event with the boys from the Dispatch, uh, the return of Peter Suderman and Catherine Mangu Ward. Welcome back, super friends. Howdy. Happy Monday. Activate. Activate. Uh, <laughs> form of like a Voltron, right? Super friends. No, yeah. the, the super twins activate. No, we're, I'm the lion robot. Catherine, uh, you've got blue hair. What did you learn from your vacation? Uh, I was on vacation in uh, Joe Biden's Rehoboth, Delaware. Uh, Holy and cow. I learned that the uh, the seagulls are more aggressive than ever in Joe Biden's America. Uh, they're um, not very gullible. Yeah. I hate you. Uh, Come on. Man. Come on, man. Uh, I went to Joe yeah. Biden's President Joe Biden's expressway on Sunday. That was very exciting. Uh, and then went to Biden Way or Boulevard or whatever in Scranton, Pennsylvania, uh, which is so exciting that I got back on the freeway about five minutes later. Uh, Scranton, Scranton's not sending their best. So. You know what I learned about Scranton this week? Mm. I was writing my upcoming editor's note for the next issue, which is about my favorite uh, my favorite razor. It's not Occam's razor. It's Hanlon's razor. I talk about it all the time on this podcast. And it turns out- Does it have five blades? Nope. It's just the one, but it's the one that tells us not to attribute to malice that which can adequately explain by stupidity. And it was mm. originally uh, coined by a Scrantonian. So. Oh. There you go. I hope it was a 19th century baseballer, Ned Hanlon, but I kind of think it wasn't. It was the confusingly named Robert Hanlon, who, but then it was taken up by Robert Heinlein, so everyone's confused. Uh, all right. So last week's uh, podcast, after this banter, that was insert banter. I like that. that uh, was, yeah. <laughs> uh, last week was sort of predicated on the idea that uh, Kamala Harris, who is the uh, Democratic uh, Party's presidential nominee in the 2024 election, um, and also the current vice president, uh, that she was about uh, ready to select as her running mate, probably Josh Shapiro, uh, the comparatively mm. centrist governor of Pennsylvania, from which I podcast, uh, and who was dominating in the betting markets until basically the last minute, uh, right up to the actual selection, which turned out to be right around the time that our podcast was published, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz. Uh, since then, we've learned a lot about the Bernie-supported bro. Uh, first, that you pronounce his name, Walls. Um, uh, also, that he's giving Midwestern coach dad vibes and that too many journalists have daddy problems. Yeah, or, and have forgotten we knew the, that. Last, the last national coach uh, yeah. Midwestern politician, the coach Dennis Hastert, they were just available for comment. Finally, there was a politician who could fix their stereos. Uh, yes, which is why we don't elect Peter Suderman. Uh, other things that we learned is that he also had, uh, per Robbie Suave and other reason uh, reporters, a pretty damned dystopian record when it comes to COVID restrictions. Uh, he has very bad ideas about hate speech not being free speech. He nonetheless loves his campaign applause generator of uh, minding your own damn business. Um, and also, we've learned that Republicans are still trying to figure out where to go, uh, wh whether we do the nickname of Tampon Tim, for reasons I'm just not going to figure out, uh, or to suggest that his descriptions of his own 24-year career in the military has come on occasion pretty darn close to stolen valor. Uh, and not insignificantly, we've learned that Kamala Harris is now kind of up in the polls, uh, at least national polls, and uh, a 50-50 or maybe slightly better uh, chance in the Electoral College, just as a snapshot at the moment, who knows what the next moment will bring. And uh, meanwhile, Donald Trump is kind of flailing around in his own flop sweat uh, recently. So Catherine, we haven't seen you in a while. Uh, new hair color, whatnot. Uh, can you talk about what you find significant about the man, the governor, the vice presidential candidate, Tim Walls? So I will tell you, there was a point on my vacation when uh, people were on their phones, the other adults were on their phones reading out walls tidbits and i was like can you not like i'm <laughs> off this week uh, but i have now caught not up in an election year you're not i now know things about him um the one thing that actually really struck me is a couple of the different write-ups about why he was chosen including in the new york times had a version of a sentence that was something like 
over and over in the selection process, loyalty was emphasized as one of the most important criteria for Harris. And, you know, that was absolutely a, a knock on Trump, right? He values loyalty over everything, including competence, including sanity. Um, and I think, you know, it's just very telling that this is now being reported as like, you know, he's a good dude and he's going to be loyal to Harris. And that shows her good judgment. Um, I think ideally we would want someone in the vice presidential slot who is many, many things before we get to loyalty on the list. Uh, it's as if the people treat um, different parties, presidential candidates uh, uh, differently. That can't be right. Differently. Surely not. Uh, according to maybe their own preferences. Uh, Peter, uh, uh, New York Times profilee, uh, Barry Weiss, uh, had a one liner saying that the walls is a normie in the streets, but squad in the sheets, which is funny. But uh, is it mm. fair uh, or how else would you describe or characterize uh, Mr. Minnesota Nice's uh, policies? I think that's a funny way of saying that Walls talks like a Midwestern moderate. And if you look at his governing record, he is like Kamala Harris, a bigger government liberal. Like, in the, So I have I have argued consistently on this podcast and in the pages of Reason, the best way to understand Joe Biden is he's not a progressive. He's not a leftist in the kind of radical sense, but he is a big government liberal. And everything we have seen from Kamala Harris, who is admittedly a little bit of a shapeshifter on policy, suggests that she is an even bigger government liberal. And I think that is also true of Walls. And that is one of the reasons why she picked him. So I think there there's a couple of ways to look at the Walls pick. One is she didn't want someone who would overshadow her. This is this is not something that I am inventing out of thin air. This is coming from the campaign. They're saying we didn't want somebody who would uh, who, who would take the attention off of the main candidate. But another way of saying that is she didn't want somebody who was likely to be good at the job. And one thing, you know, we we might not love all of Shapiro's policies, right? We might not. He's a Democratic governor, right? He's somebody who, but he's pretty competent. He seems like he has things under control. And she didn't want the person who seemed like they had things under control because that would take attention off of her. But she did want somebody who was going to be out there making fun of Donald Trump in a really clever way, right? So Wall's one of the, like, Probably the single biggest thing that he did to get this pick was he called the Trump Republicans, he called J.D. Vance weird. And he made that a thing. Everybody was like, oh, we're going to write columns with the word weird in the headline. And, you know, chin stroke a little bit about what it means to be weird and how Republicans got weird. And is weird bad or like. And so we did like two whole weeks of think pieces about weird because Walls said the word weird on cable news. And that's why they picked him. They picked him. Uh, look, this is not totally unprecedented. Often the vice pres presidential pick is supposed to be someone who was an attack dog, but they kind of picked him because it seemed like he was good at making fun of Donald Trump. And that's what they wanted, was somebody who wouldn't overshadow Harris, but would be clever in the way that he needled the opponent, that, uh, you know, said orange man bad in a new and funny and catchy way. And so I think that's a big part of it. But then there are also policy implications here because uh, Walls is arguably the most progressive governor in the country. He is somebody who has pushed, uh, who has pushed big spending programs, big social wel welfare programs. He's a big healthcare guy. He's a big uh, tax hiker and a redistributionist, in addition to all of the bad stuff on free speech and COVID that we've already been here. And that just tells you that Kamala Harris is very comfortable with a big spending social welfare guy who just, just like, let's raise taxes on the rich and let's redistribute uh, and let's do more social programs, regardless of whether they work. That's what Kamala Harris wanted to be partnered with, not someone who was competent and moderate and centrist, not someone who would reach out to people who were gettable, but maybe somewhat uncomfortable with Kamala Harris on the Democratic ticket. She wanted to pick somebody who was already on board with the bigger government, bigger, you know, the, the, the bigger government agenda that she represents. Nick, uh, last week, our uh, frenemies at the dispatch mm. uh, were thinking kind of about the Josh Shapiro pick, a uh, putative uh, P Shapiro pick as part of a pattern of kind of uh, uh, indications that Harris was recognizing that the country is more moderate centrist than she is and that she was pragmatically moving to the middle, even though that's showing that she might be kind of a hypocrite on a series of issues. I know that was their take more than yours, but how does the Walls pick kind of um, uh, affect the way that you think about what Harris is doing and, and her own presidential kind of uh, uh, profile? I think what he represents is a nod to the progressive wing of the Democratic Party and that this is a way because he's a big backer 
uh, not simply in terms of his policies and things like that. And if you go through, uh, Cato ranks the governors, uh, you know, uh, they give them a fiscal report card. His ratings or his grades are bad, but uh, he's actually kind of within the mainstream of how bad governors have been, uh, partly because he had a... Uh, a, uh, a mixed uh, legislature for part of his term, but also because everybody started spending tons more money during COVID and in the wake of that and things like that. But he is a nod to the progressive wing of the uh, of the Democratic Party, even if his policies on, on things like Israel are not particularly different than Josh Shapiro's. I think that's the main function of what he's doing. Um, I, I don't buy into the idea that, um, you know, politicians are worried about, um, you know, having a, a vice presidential candidate who's going to overshadow them. I think they're, you know, they're obviously all politicians are vain, but they want to win. Um, that's where this kind of pick uh, is really a head scratcher, because uh, like J.D. Vance for Trump, it's not exactly clear what Walls gives to uh, Kamala Harris, other than maybe quieting people at the Democratic National Convention who are going to attack her for abetting genocide in uh, Gaza and things like that. Uh, for me, the key factor in, you know, his state or like what what is so great about Minnesota, because now we're starting to be treated to all of these, uh, you know, newly new discovered pieces about how like, oh, Minnesota is like the Sweden of America, um, you know, because he's he gives he puts free tampons in uh, public school bathrooms, which, by the way, I want to point out, I think that's a good idea. I mean, unless you believe that kids should have to pay for their own toilet paper, like there's nothing wrong with putting, you know, bathroom products in gender appropriate bathrooms. That seems to me to be kind of a no, uh, no brainer. Wait, isn't the uh, real libertarian answer here that there shouldn't be public schools? Well, there shouldn't be public schools that, uh, you know, that don't punish the children, I suppose. We call them prisons, Peter. They're low, low security <laughs> prisons. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, Minnesota has uh, is 41st in the in terms of net migration into the state. It's a place that people have been leaving. And if you look at high income earners are leaving there, it is a relatively small population state because it is not a pleasant place to live, as Bob Dylan could tell you, just because of nature. But nothing that Tim Walls has done has made it more habitable either. So um, I think he's a wash. His main function, and he's been successful at this, is giving us another week or two before anybody actually starts talking about Kamala. Then it's time for the convention. Then it's a sprint to the election. Um, the main thing that everybody is doing, and I think we're even kind of abetting this, is like not focusing on who is Kamala Harris as a candidate in the same way, you know, Trump, we can't, we know who he is because he was president, but like, what is he talking about now? What is she talking about now? And it comes down to a, a big lot of nothing. So just to follow up really quickly on what, on what Nick said, I, I think it's important to just to kind of emphasize that by not picking Shapiro and by picking Walls, what Harris is revealing about herself is the thing that I've been saying for months now, which is that she is only comfortable playing an inside game with Democratic Party elites and core party voters. And this was a pick to appease those people rather than a pick to reach out to exactly. potentially persuadable people uh, who are who are maybe not totally on board with a Harris agenda or a Harris presidency. This and is the this problem. just shows that she, this is how she rose up in California. It's how she got the vice presidential vice presidential nod to begin with and it is how she got the, the on the ticket as the president at no point did she reach out and persuade people in the middle instead every single time she rolled up the democratic elite uh, the the party uh, power brokers and appealed to them and them alone and that is her entire political this strategy and her whole political career is the problem with presidential politics right now nobody is actually going to you know the the vast majority of independents or plurality of independents are not being spoken to in any kind of consistent way. And instead, uh, you know, the the pieces that are foregrounding Tim Wall's fatherly, non-threatening, you know, post-male menopause masculinity are part of this. I mean, I, I can't believe that anybody, you know, is, are we in such a psychosexual kind of meltdown that we are dying to talk about candidates as post-sexual mother and father figures. Like, what the fuck yes. happened to this country? Hundred yeah, percent. Yes, we are. Nobody, nobody, <laughs> it, nobody who is an undecided voter, 
uh, which is a plurality of people, right, are independents, they're not partisans, are saying, you know what I really need is some guy who can, uh, you know, program my VCR. Uh, two um, things or, to, or I need to J.D. Add, Vance to be a dick, you know. Two it's things like, to add to that are that um, uh, Harris, unlike Biden, is now pretty comfortably ahead among independents. Uh, Biden hadn't been for a very long time, which is one of the reasons why him running against Trump was not looking like a very safe bet for the Democrats. Uh, and the other is that Kamala Harris for now seems to be moving a lot of undecided voters into the decided category. People, it is a time for choosing. It's beginning to be a more, which is kind of interesting. Catherine, listening to both Nick and Peter talk a little bit, I think I want to float a unified Mitch Daniel theories of the universe. And I just said that really to get your attention at the beginning of what is otherwise going to be a long uh, question. Um, but Mitch Daniels, very good governor, uh, good president of Purdue, right? Uh, I think he was. Mm -hmm. um, and just a competent dude uh, and all, all obviously one of your um, uh, sexy American boyfriends. Um, he was uh, floated as an idea to run for president in 2012. He decided not to. And part of, I think, the calculus of not to is that like the world didn't want that anymore. Like the Republican Party didn't want that. There's quite a number of libertarians who scoffed at people like Catherine Mangu Ward for saying, hey, you know, someone like Mitch Daniels would be pretty good. George Will was talking about Mitch Daniels, like a prudent, fiscally conservative person who didn't want to foreground um, culture war battles and and so on. People are like, screw that guy. We need someone who fights. Um, we so need Mitch, Dan Mitt Romney. Uh, well, Mitt Romney is an interesting power uh, figure. Puncher. So my unified theory is this. Between 1976 and 2008, all but four of those years, we had a president who was a former governor. And usually it was a former governor who was kind of an interesting governor in some cases, like pretty objectively good governor. I think George W. Bush was a good governor of Texas, for example. Reagan was more uh, controversial in California, but definitely interesting. Carter had a, an interesting record in Georgia, Clinton in Arkansas. Um, we don't do that anymore. Um, at some point that stopped and the governors that we select are even to be a vice president or who like have any uh, chance of running anywhere above like 3% in a national uh, primary for a political party. Um, they are not the ones who have an objectively interesting record. I mean, you can dislike Ron DeSantis both as a politician and some of the things that uh, as a candidate, some of the things that he's done, but he's been an objectively interesting governor, particularly on COVID related policies and education. Jared Polis in Colorado, objectively interesting. Good Shapiro, I think, falls into that category. Those are not the people that the national political system right now is rewarding or the politicians that rise in it, like uh, Suderman's uh, Kamala Harris path to to, uh, kind of victory. Uh, they don't want any of that stuff. They want the Tim Canes. They want like boring people um, who are not shiny and not interesting and not like turning their states from battleground states to plus 20 for their parties. And they're not competent. And there's something about our politics right now and our electoral political mood um, that is not just psychosexual post menopause or whatever the hell Nick was saying. Um, but uh, but also like we don't seek to solve problems anymore. What do you say about my half-baked universal theory of Mitch Daniels, Catherine Maggie Wharton? Uh, I will. I will finish baking your theory. I think it's. I think it's a good one. Uh, I did just uh, chat with my American boyfriend, Mitch Daniels, on Liberty Fund's Future of Liberty podcast, which you can see if you want to, uh, and here if you want to check it out. We talked about some of this stuff, um, and yeah, I think that there, there's like. This fantasy that there's a trade off between like, OK, somebody can be kind of rhetorically flashy, but incompetent or um, competent and boring. And uh, I think your like resorting of this is right, that it's actually just like, did you did you govern interestingly in your state? Did you govern like effectively in the sense of like you got things done, not necessarily the things that you or I would have wanted to see, but something. Um, and uh, I think that. All of this is down to the thing that we talk about all the time, which is um, our, our elected officials will not be governing in any meaningful sense. Like they will not be passing laws. They will not be enacting them. They will not be doing the business of solving the problems of the country. They're going to be doing shouty culture war at each other and they're going to be spending money. But that's not the same thing as governing. And there's going to be uh, budget this was, week between Christmas and right. New Year's <laughs> Eve. Sure. Be, we'll have we'll have budget panic week, which is. Again, not governing. Um, and I think, you know, Mitch Daniels got in trouble back in the day for saying we simply don't have time to do the culture war because our 
our fiscal issues are so severe. And everyone was like, shut up and sit down, Mitch. We can't we can't talk about that right now. Um, I think that a person who really um, exemplifies this, although not a governor, is Pete Buttigieg, who has been, you know, on every single podcast and every single interview. Uh, he showed up on like, there's a Robert Caro book club that he somehow was participating in. He has a lot of time to do media because I think he has correctly sussed out that absolutely no one will care at all if he's been effective in his current role, which is the head of a cabinet agency. Like no one cares. No one is going to be like, hey, did he do anything good there? Because we're not interested in that anymore from our politicians. And he he rose to fame as the mayor of uh, South Bend, Indiana, which made no appreciable improvements under his tutelage. Correct. Like not even yeah. as a mayor was he effective, but having he given- He put in having, bike lanes. That was having, like the big thing. Having been given charge of tens of, of thousands people. of federal employees and the chance maybe to like do something with a, yeah. an enormous budget. He was like, nah, I think I'm just going to go on the radio a lot. What is interesting, though, about Tim Walls, then, is Just that like he us. actually, within Minnesota, he's successful. He's a popular governor. Uh, he ended up with a Democratic legislature uh, and things like that. And a lot of the stuff that he pushes rhetorically fits well with a kind of national conservatism, you know, pro-natalism, constantly talking about helping families and just shoveling more government money at the types of social organizations and families, blah, 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 that we like and not at the ones we don't like. And of course, as I think it was Eric Baim at Reason pointed out, you know, a lot of the money that went to various nonprofits in Minnesota under his tutelage were, it was complete junk, you know, in, in terms of COVID relief or inflation uh, reduction and things like that. But that to me is the bigger story that's coming into focus in this election cycle is you know, there there will be a, a Republican and a Democratic flavor of this, but a new consensus is forming, which is that, you know, fiscal rectitude does not matter. Taxes kind of matter, but nobody really cares about bringing revenue and expenditures anywhere within, uh, you know, striking distance of one another. And that we have just, uh, you know, our political class and many, many of us, many voters just believe that it doesn't really matter if you're paying for this stuff or not. But the government should just be doing more, more, more for the things that I want. And we don't have to worry about paying the bill. And that is deeply, deeply disturbing because you see that in a version on the Republican side of this aisle, as well as the Democratic side. And it's it's got to end at some point. And it's going to end with a lot of heartbreak. It does seem like the conversation around taxes specifically now has two positions that don't speak to each other at all. And one is we should raise taxes on rich people. And the other is, we should cut taxes. Don't worry about how we're going to pay for stuff. Like, those are the two positions. And that's it. Like, that's the whole conversation. And neither and of those even... And the idea that taxes no, no. are supposed to pay for spending, eh, maybe. There is a third component of this, which is that we shouldn't tax workers' tips. Kamala Harris oh. actually came out and put that uh, like as a thing I think she's going to do now after Trump brain farted it into existence in June. So that's that's the big tax proposal for this election is should we tax their tips? There not? was a there was a sad moment when the uh, the reason staff was watching uh, the the RNC. And at the end, we were like, OK, so was there any economic policy. And we were like, I guess not, not really. And then we were like, oh, no, there was the taxing tips thing. That was it. That's that's what we got. Who knew that the opening scene of Reservoir Dogs would turn out to be such an influential policy document? Let's we're, just let Steve that Buscemi sit. complains yeah, about taxing tips. Yes, and the whole, we, it's a whole we know the scene. Come on. We know Explain. the scene. Thanks. Thanks. Everyone likes it. When Steve the Buscemi is, is my idol when it comes uh, to taxing. All right. Uh, shifting gears, there's a super intriguing piece in the Wall Street Journal on Sunday that you probably didn't read because most people don't read newspapers. Uh, but uh, the headline was I read it's... newspapers on TikTok, Matt. Does that count? <laughs> Again, I'm just going to let that sit here um, so we can marinate in the effluvia. Uh, headline I, was I quit, actually too late in secret talks. U.S. offers amnesty to Venezuela's Maduro for ceding power. That is C-E-D, not S-E-E-D, ceding power. Uh, President Nicolas Maduro, of course, uh, refused to recognize the results of the overwhelming um, July 28th uh, election 
uh, in which Venezuelans uh, voted to send him packing. Uh, he spent the time ever since jailing thousands of dissidents and cracking down on any public manifestation of disquiet at his uh, ongoing authoritarian misrule. According to the journal, the U.S. had made an amnesty offer to Maduro during secret talks in Doha last year, even before this mess, uh, but the dictator was not interested. Washington is trying to nudge the lefty governments of Brazil, Mexico, and Colombia to go a little harder at Maduro. Currently, they're like, hey, can you like prove uh, your claims about this election? From all the reporting that I've looked at, it seems that the election results were held on Amazon servers and really easily lookable. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, I don't know what kind of result he's going to conjure into existence. There are uh, something like five months until the next uh, presidential inauguration. So that's what the deadline that people are working for in the midst of this uh, ongoing horrible uh, tragedy. Catherine, uh, how do you solve a problem like Venezuela? Um, uh, but uh, kind of actually that is the question. Like, what sh is this a proper thing for Washington to, to do? What do you do when the bad country does the bad thing? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the people who know the answer to how do you solve a problem like Venezuela are in Venezuela and are unfortunately now in jail in Venezuela. And that is um, it's a disaster, right? Like I, this, this, um, the thousands of detentions, um, there's so many details about them that are that are like extra horrifying, including um, that they used the equivalent of like the the 311 app that they had in Venezuela that you were supposed to use to like report potholes. And Maduro was like, yeah, just use it to report political dissidents. And people did because they live in a horrifying authoritarian state and they're just trying to survive. Um, one person who was arrested uh, while she was live streaming was uh, Maria Oropesa, who is a member of Lola and SFL. So, um, you know, a libertarian friend. Um, she was the opposition party leader in Portuguesa, which is... Um, I think outside of Caracas and um, you can hear her on the live stream saying like, do you have a warrant? Which is incredibly ballsy. Um, wow. and, you know, this is my private property is what she says. And then they take her away and no one knows where she is. Um, so it's just genuinely, genuinely shocking. Um, I, I actually think that the U S uh, the U S offer to Maduro is a reasonable one. I think this is the kind of thing where if you know, if this if this is being powered by fear for his personal safety, great, take that away because millions and millions of people are suffering. Um, I think that's a kind of practical diplomatic thing we can do. I sure do wish we weren't in the process of kind of trying to jail our own former leaders for political reasons, because, you know, it hurts our credibility on matters like this. Nick, um, the thing that I'm always struck with in thinking about Venezuela and also thinking about America's kind of response role, whatever, um, is that the migrant crisis is a Venezuela crisis. There are something like 8 million people have left Venezuela. I mean, to, to rephrase Catherine's uh, kind of answer, you know, some of the people to solve that problem are now outside of Venezuela and they are being treated like a giant problem in America. And it's this interesting to me disconnect between, you know, there's a natural, I think, American sympathy for victims of an authoritarian socialist regime. Um, and somehow that doesn't enter the chat when we're talking about the people coming in uh, on our southern border, who many of whom are, are Venezuelans. What, how do you look at that problem and our kind of national response to uh, what is a refugee crisis and our sort of moral imagination in, in considering what to do? I, yeah, that's those are fantastic questions. And Venezuela, the Venezuela diaspora, forced diaspora because of Chavez and then Maduro is the biggest migrant crisis in the new world, you know, in, in the whatever Eastern Hemisphere, Western Hemisphere. And anything that we could do to minimize that would be fantastic, first and foremost, for the people in Venezuela, then for the neighboring countries and then including our own place. And to my mind, the idea of offering refuge or safe passage and immunity from further prosecution to Maduro, if that got him out of power and left a situation that was fixable, that is obviously 
a great use of American state power. I mean, I would be willing to pay taxes for that in a way that I'm not willing to pay taxes for, uh, you know, overt invasions of foreign countries or regime change that is always poorly done and things like that. So I think it's worth, you know, thinking about seriously. And, you know, and that's a uh, kudo, uh, you know, to the Biden administration on that point. That question about what happens to people, you know, Venezuelans fleeing an authoritarian socialist government, which has been promoted heavily by many useful idiots in, in the academy here in America and the news media and among politicians who are all Chavistas and things like that, is something those people should be held accountable. But so should the people who are saying, you know, Venezuelans who leave a brutal authoritarian dictatorship are just coming here to vote for Democrats, which is the type of idiotic language and rhetoric that you hear from uh, nativist Republicans and things like that. This this needs to change. And if we bring an understanding of how Chavez got into power, there's a brilliant video essay about seven minutes long by Jason Silva, who was born in Venezuela and left the country and uh, is now a kind of like um, uh, human potential guru in various ways that is beautiful and telling because he notes how things went from uh, Venezuela being the wealthiest country in South America to Chavez being able to take power for some legitimate reasons or on some uh, some legitimate issues and then slowly choking off all opposition and then giving rise to Maduro, who is Chavez without any fancy language, without any poetry. Um, that is worth understanding um, because that can happen in a lot of places and it is happening in a lot of places. I would also recommend people to read uh, Jim Epstein's piece at Reason about how Hayek's uh, kind of formulation in The Road to Serfdom talks about why people like Maduro and before him Chavez tend to rise to the top. These are all issues that can be, or problems that can be minimized, if not eradicated fully. But we need to start talking about this stuff in a way that is not simply about contemporary partisan politics, and you know, which ends up being, we have to stop you know, everything at the Southern border. Um, that's what we need to be doing in order to fix you know, problems in America. Um, it would be much better if we um, actually did something to help stabilize Venezuela, that is not simply a terrible, horrifying replay of awful American interference in Latin American countries as well as other parts of the world. Peter, um, you know, uh, Kamala Harris has recently been unveiling ads where, wow, she looks like a border hawk. <laughs> what happened there? That's not, I don't remember that one. Uh, and let's recall that when she was not the border czar, but when she was the point person for half a minute uh, in the Biden administration in 2021, her most famous gesture was to go to Central America and tell prospective uh, migrants to go home. Uh, do you have any indication from, uh, you know, uh, sampling the vibes of the Democratic Party and its uh, ticket right now that they are thinking in a... Uh, a whole of government way about the refugee crisis coming out of Venezuela. You mean like they did with antitrust for the last three and a half years? Yeah. They try to do it in all the departments, yeah. even the ones where the head of the department is just doing podcasts all the time, where like <laughs> everybody's everybody's just trying to find some way to do some more antitrust. Well, look at how that worked out for them. They've lost most of the case. Okay, uh, so let's let's move beyond antitrust here. I think that the way the Democratic Party is feeling about immigration can be summed up as they're scared. They're scared because they see that when you poll voters and especially independents, the top two issues, depending on how you ask the questions, are always the economy, uh, which mostly means inflation and prices, and then immigration. And those two issues are, in the minds of many independent voters, connected because they believe that uh, immigrants are coming here, taking jobs, uh, making the economy worse. Uh, and, and they think uh, they see polls that show that... Uh, that voters trust Republicans and Donald Trump more on immigration. Donald Trump is out there as a hawk's hawk saying he's just going to shut down the border. And I think he released something today, one of his 20 points uh, uh, for his his agenda for the if, if he becomes president again was something like the largest deportation ever. Right. And so Democrats just see this as we've got to compete with that because 
that's what because this is something people care about and this is how trump is addressing it and so uh, they're not thinking in a whole of government way they're not even thinking about like what outcome do we want from policy way they are only thinking about what do we need to do what do we feel like we need to do to compete with this on an electoral politics basis with independent voters who are scared of immigration and scared of the border and so no there is no sensible thinking about this there is only poll driven fear going into an election where they think that this is a losing issue for them. All right. We're going to go to our listener question of the week here in a moment. But first, a word from our sponsors over at Lumen. Before we continue with the Reason Roundtable, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Lumen, the world's first handheld metabolic coach. It's a device that measures your metabolism through your breath. Then on the Lumen app, it lets you know if you're burning fat or carbs and gives you tailored guidance to improve your nutrition, workout, sleep, and even stress management. All you have to do is breathe into your lumen first thing in the morning, and you'll know what's going on with your metabolism, whether you're burning mostly fats or carbs. Then, lumen gives you a personalized nutrition plan for that day based on your measurements. You can also breathe into it before and after workouts and meals, so you know exactly what's going on in your body in real time. I've tried it, and I've got to tell you, Lumen is a great tool for motivation and information. It's easy, and it's fun to use. Seriously. Your metabolism is your body's engine. It's how your body turns the food you eat into fuel that keeps you going. Because your metabolism is at the center of everything your body does, optimal metabolic health translates to a bunch of benefits, including easier weight management, improved energy levels, better fitness results, and better sleep. Lumen gives you recommendations to improve your metabolic health. And get this, it can also track your cycle as well as the onset of menopause, women, and adjust your recommendations to keep your metabolism healthy through hormonal shifts so you can keep up your energy and stave off cravings. So if you want to take the next step in improving your health, go to lumen.me and use Roundtable to get $100 off your Lumen. That's L-U-M-E-N D-O-T dot M-E and use Roundtable at checkout for $100 off. Thanks, Lumen, for sponsoring this episode. And now back to the Reason Roundtable. Okay, reminder to email your short queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from the marvelously named Dakota Blitch, who writes, Hello, Roundtable. I recently heard on an Economist podcast Uh, that the EU wants to place 20% plus tariffs on Chinese electric vehicles due to what it claims are unfair subsidies, tax breaks, and cheap loans. Libertarians support free trade uh, because it doesn't make sense to produce something that someone else produces better and cheaper. However, libertarians also do not support government subsidies. So does this make Chinese EV tariff policy a murkier issues for libertarians? Catherine. No. Why it not? It's not murky. It's this is there's this is a very common argument and so you know I think it's always worth addressing it again. Um there are a couple things. First of all, we also subsidize, favor and otherwise prop up our electric vehicle industry. Uh this is this is not something that like China is doing and meanwhile we're just over here living the free market dream. So, um if they are guilty, we are also guilty. Um, certainly to a different degree. And um, always important to keep in mind that some Chinese labor is very, very cheap because it is enslaved political prisoners. Um, So that is all fair to keep in mind. But in the end, um, first of all, it it is not important that we make everything here, uh, as long as people continue to be willing to sell stuff to us, indeed need to sell stuff to us. China needs to sell us those EVs to keep their industry going. Um, That's enough to rely on. And the second is, if they want to make those vehicles cheaper for us by taxing Chinese people and spending that money on their side of the equation, we should say thank you and buy cheap stuff. Um, This has served us very, very well uh, over many, many years. Uh, Of course, I would like to see everyone simply do a open trade in goods without all of these subsidies and distortions. But I do not think the fact that China is aggressively intervening in their electric vehicle industry or any other industry means we should um, make those products more expensive for Americans by slapping a tariff on them 
retaliatorily, which is what most people propose we do. Peter, uh, the Biden administration seems really proud of its EV policy. Should it be proud of its EV policy? Oh, absolutely. They've spent, I think it's something like six or seven billion dollars uh, on making as many as that, as seven <laughs> EV charging <laughs> stations. Mm. And that's really I mean, that's so impressive it's a game because, changer. because for a billion dollars, you know, you couldn't have you, uh, you I guess you could have built like a couple of bus shelters. Uh, and like the EV charging stations are so much more useful because those bus shelters, they don't even have, you know, like a, a real umbrella for you to sit under the shade unless you're like a, a very, very tiny, thin person. Um, and, and I'm not. So I'm I'm for the, the one billion dollar EV chargers. Super big accomplishment. We wouldn't have had that without governments. And, uh, you know, the Biden administration really to credit. Uh, Nick, I think uh, Peter has gone to the special nihilist dark place that you've been living in for 30 <laughs> sure. years. So welcome in, him in fondly uh, and uh, pass the arsenic or whatever. Uh, what say you to this common refrain um, about, you know, trading with China? Um, you know, they they uh, we can't have free trade because this isn't fair trade. They will never do fair trade. So therefore, we need to do something. This is popular now in both political parties. Uh, by a lot. So what's your libertarian response? Oh, Mr. Libertarian. I agree completely with Catherine that once if you start the argument that you can't really do free trade with another country because of X, Y and Z, mostly which always starts at the moment that what they're selling is cheaper uh, than what is being produced here. Uh, otherwise, um, then the discussion is over. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to me that it should be Amer Americans should not pay a penalty because Chinese workers uh, get paid less and the Chinese government subsidizes exports. Um, the best thing that we can do is uh, see if those products are worth buying uh, with or without subsidies from the American government and let them flourish. Matt, you, uh, like myself and like Tim Waltz, who I want to point out is the uh, Wilford Brimley of political candidates. He's the same age as Brad Pitt, and yet he looks like he has not yet gone to that distant planet where you get young again. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, you're old enough to remember the Yugo, the oh, three God, cylinder yes. monstrosity from the uh, former uh, communist country that came in. And it was like when it was being sold in America, and this would have been, I think, in the 80s, maybe the late 70s, but certainly the 80s. It came in several thousand dollars cheapest, cheaper than the absolute shit that GM and Ford and Chrysler uh, were putting out. And it did not find a market because it sucked. Um, that's the free market at, at work. It was subsidized by Yugoslavia. It was subsidized by German tourists who would go to Dubrovnik in order to, you know, fuck around in a communist country. Um, and it failed. So bring over the Chinese uh, EVs and we'll see. If they're anything like the rest of stuff on Timu, uh, you won't even be able to get both of your legs in the car anyway. There's a similar case uh, just of when it comes to drugs and uh, to pharmaceuticals, because uh, this is something where conservatives have often argued, oh, we shouldn't allow drug reimportation from countries that subsidize drug uh, drug prices and where those drugs are much cheaper. Um, but if you look at the Cato Institute uh, in particular, has just has consistently made, a, I, I think, a quite strong case that Americans should allow drug reimportation of drugs that we know are safe, uh, that have been subsidized by other countries so that Americans can get access to those cheap, uh, those less expensive uh, for, you know, at, at the out of pocket is less expensive um, uh, because the drugs are drug prices are different in other countries. And I think the same logic here uh, applies to EVs and to other things as well. I reiterate my call for uh, any political party either to adopt or a new one to be created around the idea of low cost. My policies will be ones that will lower costs. Is this so a policy Harris that raises costs? Whatever you Walmart do, don't let me party. talk. Uh, uh, the, if this is a policy that raises costs, I'm not going to favor that one. Is this a policy that lowers costs? I think I'm going to favor that one. I think that I think there's a real uh, the potential for that. Go ahead, Peter. So I was just going to say, Harris is uh, apparently gearing up to run on we're going to fix inflation and lower costs. But the way she's going to do it is through subsidies and price controls. No. And it's going to be subsidies and price controls that she says are going to lower costs for ordinary Americans. And that's going to be her pitch on the economy is we're going to solve the inflation problem that the Joe Biden and Kamala Harris administration helped cause. And we're going to solve it with 
price controls, with subsidies, with more dumb policies that don't fix the underlying problems. All right. Speaking of the FDA, uh, we learned on Friday that the Food and Drug Administration declined to approve MDMA, commonly known as ecstasy or molly or the thing that makes you rub the carpets and listen to bad techno music, uh, as a treatment for post-traumatic traumatic stress dis disorder. I don't know why that's hard for me to talk about. I guess it was all the I think maybe you should see somebody about that, Matt. It's too late. Uh, according to NBC News, this marked the first time that the FDA had considered a Schedule One psychedelic for medical use, though it rejected that. It also would have been the first new approved treatment for PTSD, easier to pronounce, uh, in more than two decade, decades, <clears throat> I just words not easy for me. Uh, Nick, uh, you follow this stuff Matt, closely. You're choking up because you're getting close to an issue. Come on, go. Don't run from it. Go deep. Why are you? <laughs> why are you afraid to talk about trauma? Nick, you're you're getting ahead of our uh, the time we do the roundtable after we all take MDMA, and oh, it's yeah. not that's not today. Oh, when we all do. I uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I got all sorry all of us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ooh, that just like to touch such... my shoulders. Okay, please episode. stop that. We should do that. Uh, what's the significance and impact of this decision, O. Nick Gillespie? Uh, you know, it uh, it's deeply disappointing. Um, the group that had been pushing this, MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, was founded in 1986 to make this a reality. And they had finally dragged uh, everything to the finish line with copious assistance and support from the FDA. So this comes as a you know as a, as a real disappointment uh because this is decades in the making and i'll i'll just point out also that it, the the approval was for mdma assisted psychotherapy uh right. for ptsd and a couple of other indications and you know that's important because when you talk to uh therapists they have said and uh in the uh documentary that uh zach weismuller and i did uh, in last year's MAP Psychedelic Science Conference, we talked to Julie Holland, who's a, a, a medical doctor who worked at Bellevue for years and treats patients. And she says blankly or starkly that there had, you know, we're out of drugs that work for things like PTSD. There just isn't anything new that's coming along that is working. And this is a drug that shows enormous promise with virtually no downsides. You know, the, the FDA says that it authorizes drugs or it makes sure that they are both safe and effective. Um, and they say that, you know, the Lycos, which is the public benefits corporation that was spun off from MAPS to actually um, produce and distribute and ultimately market MDMA once it was legal, uh, have failed to do that. There will be appeals. Um, the FDA is saying, well, you can do some more studies, which will take years. There are other psychedelic compounds that are further along in the pipeline for authorization, uh, dealing with psilocybin for similar issues. Those will come up for approval if, assuming that Lycos maps goes forward. But this is, uh, you know, it's, it's a harsh blow because this was the company and the group that was working within the system. There is a flourishing underground therapy market that is growing up everywhere. And in a way, you know, from a, a kind of drug legalization perspective or drug use perspective, this is bad. There's no question about it. And it seems to be largely unfounded. The, the issues that were raised were actually addressed in all of the studies and things like that. But the underground is going to continue. Um, and I think what you will see over the next decade is that similar to medical marijuana and recreational marijuana, various states will start uh, okaying all of this stuff. And then there will be, finally, Washington will be surrounded and they will cave in on it, similar to the way they're about to do with marijuana. And this is something, you know, just to bring back to the terrible presidential election that we all want to forget about, uh, you know, both Kamala Harris uh, has been very good on, on descheduling marijuana since she's been in uh, federal office, both as a senator as well as vice president. And Donald Trump is also on board with that. So, that's probably the way that a lot of these, you know, this type of drug is going to make it into the mainstream is uh, routing around the FDA, which re remains a generally useless, negative institution in American life. Catherine, I know you've been low key encroaching on Nick's uh, psychedelics turf. Uh, as you enter uh, the glorious there's middle room years. for everybody, Matt, in the astral plane. 
uh, what <laughs> what thoughts have you? A um, couple of thoughts. One is, you know, this is this isn't the end, right? This it, it, this is it's very bad news the the FDA decision, but it does they do leave the door open, as Nick said, for appeals. They can conduct another set of trials. The problem with this whole project was that it was always asking the FDA to break a bunch of their standard procedures to make this happen, right? The, because it was combining a drug with therapy, because it's basically impossible to do a blinded study on MDMA, like, you know, if you took it, yeah. um, there's, uh, there's a bunch <laughs> of ways in which we were, we we're sort of asking the FDA to make exceptions. And the FDA is not in the mood to make these exceptions. And Nick is right that the way that the FDA eventually gets in the mood to make these exceptions is potentially state level stuff. Or, and I actually think this is a, a more likely path, the veterans groups just go really hard on this. Because the problem is the entire healthcare system that caters to veterans, they do need federal legalization. They do need legitimate clinical use recognized by the FDA. They cannot be administering MDMA at Walter Reed until it is legal at the federal level. And as long as that is the case, there will be pressure because we have a lot of veterans who have used up every option, who have tried everything and are just still really not okay. Um, and um, you know, it, I, I often kind of like the early days of medical marijuana, it was like marijuana is going to cure everything. Like it's good. It's clearing up your vision. It's fixing your back pain. It's stopping your epilepsy. And while some of those clinical uses did t turn out to pan out, there was this moment of like kind of overclaiming in what was pretty obviously in the service of broader recreational legalization. I think with MDMA, the claims are, if anything, like we are still underclaiming the clinical uses. Like people are focusing on veterans and PTSD because that's a very sympathetic group, but there are a lot of possibilities for this, all of which were research was underway before prohibition in the 60s. So, you know, the FDA was not in the mood to be accommodating. They definitely led Lycos on. Um, they suggested that they had checked a lot of boxes that then they turned around and said, oh, no, we... You didn't check those boxes. Um, so that's bullshit. But we would expect nothing less from the FDA. Peter, quickly, if you can, um, has the FDA changed its um, process, procedures, approach in any significant uh, fashion since COVID uh, in such a way to make the this type of uh, uh, unusual or different type of activity from them po more possible? I don't think that there's been any significant change. There's been, you know, paperwork process changes and there's been pressure, but it's hard to get drugs approved. It's always been hard to get drugs approved. The FDA arguably does more harm than good by regulating drugs this way. And this is frankly something that Donald Trump, of all people, should be taking up. One of the most consistent policy ideas that Trump has championed throughout the years is the right to try, which is basically, right, like you can, okay, there's a, there's a bunch of legislation that's attached to this and a bunch of specifics. But like the idea is you should have a right to put things in your body uh, if you want to, if you especially if you are sick, if you have medical problems that are unfixable any other way. And that is the situation here. And Donald Trump should should incorporate this into his pitch for right to try. In the meantime, it's bad news for people with PTSD and for Daft Punk fans. Uh, all right, let's go to our end of podcast. That's a good tee up of our end of podcast, cultural recommendations of what we've been consuming in that arena. Nick, why don't you lead us off? So I watched uh, the series Baby Reindeer, which is on Netflix, uh, and it was uh, created from a stage show by a Scottish comedian named Richard Gadd. And it is about uh, sexual abuse and stalking. Um, I cannot begin to tell you how addictive this show is. It's like, I think seven episodes, each about 40 minutes long. And to me, it reminded me of Fleabag, which was on Amazon uh, Prime. When the, you know, I, a couple of months ago, when Baby Reindeer premiered on Netflix, it would show up every time I turned the thing on. And I had no idea what it was about. And I was like, what the fuck is this? It sounds stupid. And then I finally started watching it, actually, my fiance and I, and we ended up finishing it in like, I don't, you know, if it's eight hours long, we finished it in like seven and a half hours because it is so good. It is funny and dark and weird and brooding. And it is about, 
a, a shitty comedian who works as a barkeeper at a, at a pub. And then he, he's nice to a woman and he ends up getting stalked by her. And it just proceeds from that. It is fantastic, uh, you know, in the way that something like train spotting is addictive, beautiful, wonderful, so weird. And the greatest thing about it is, you know, it's primarily about this stalker relationship. Um, and it's loosely based on the comedian's actual life. And what is great is that the the main, uh, the woman or a woman who claims she was the model for the stalker came out of the woodwork to accuse him of invading her privacy by running the show. So it just has this kind of infinite regress into reality, which is hilarious. But I can't uh, recommend Baby Reindeer enough. And I, to any uh, streaming service executives out there, <clears throat> please do a better job of matching the content of the show to the promo you release, because it's like, this is a comedy. It's funny. It's interesting. And like, you really don't get that from the way that Netflix marketed the show. But I uh, really recommend Baby Reindeer by uh, Richard Gad. It's a hard show to market in part because it's hard to summarize in one sentence. There's not a good, clear headline that you can make out of it. But that's also because built into the show is a kind of psychological astuteness about mental health problems and uh, an implied or an implicit argument that it's never just one thing and it's never even just two things it's always like a whole rubber ball band mess of health uh, of like issues some of which are like maybe your fault some of which are not some of which are understandable some of which are just people are freaking weird and have problems and like and and kind of crazy and it like really does a great job of capturing the ways that people can become just kind of messes and they're and, and not like it's not like oh my parents were mean to me i'm sad it's this it's never a straight line from a to b to z it's just like this is a whole clump of crap and that's that's what life is and it does a better job of capturing that than almost anything i've seen in, in a long time and it has a fantastic soundtrack sorry i just to cap it an Thank incredible you. soundtrack man Catherine, what did you consume? I consumed a lot of things because I was on vacation, um, including some good beach reads. But I actually want to recommend a game because I know that we have some listeners who like that. Um, I played Trial by Trolley, which is a board game of the trolley problem. Oh, man. And uh, it was good. It's from the people uh, who do Cyanide and Happiness. So it's like those little stick figures. Um, and... Uh, it technically says that it is for ages 18 and up, but we found that it was fun for the whole family and that actually <laughs> leaving the stack of cards on the table, like our, you know, middle schoolers kind of drifted over there to uh, basically you use cards to create various scenarios on the two trolley tracks and then someone has to choose who to kill. Um, very popular with the kitties. So Trial by Trolley. Uh, advertised as an adult card game of moral dilemmas and murder. I found it to be delightful for all ages. That is horrifying. Uh, Peter, what did you consume? I just always feel like the trolley problem is what city councilors have to solve when somebody proposes like a new streetcar. And the answer is always no. The trolley I choose, problem answer is no. I choose to send the trolley on whatever track Peter Suderman is on. Yeah, every I was going to say, my, uh, I, I don't have to uh, rethink that's it. That's fair. Yeah. Option one. Always. I watched The Instigators on Apple TV+. Plus. It is a new movie starring uh, Matt Damon and Casey Affleck. That's the other one. That's the younger one. It's about two bums in the Boston area. They're from Quincy in South Boston. And they uh, get roped into a robbery by a guy played by Michael Stuhlberg, Matt's buddy. Um, hey. He's just beardy and wild and sort of manic and great. Stuhlberg. Um, Stuhlbarg, I'm sorry. Uh, and so Stuhlbarg. I'm going to let Matt, per, Matt <laughs> pronounce no that H. for me. This is the one that time that Matt gets to per, to yes. correct somebody's <laughs> name pronunciation. And I'm going to let him have that that victory. Yeah. Uh, and so they they the thing that they are um, they are roped into doing is robbing the mayor on election night, because that's when all the cash bribes from all the uh, all the people in Boston who want 
city contracts are going to come in to the mayor's office, right? So it is about government corruption, and it is like it's like Ocean's Eleven. It's like a sort of righteous redistribution, except from the the corruption cash. Uh, the mayor, of course, is played by Ron Perlman, who is French, but somehow or another does a great Boston accent in this. Alfred Molina shows up just as like a guy. He's, he's a baker, actually, making some donuts, but also being part of the crime ring. Um, it's uh, it's got uh, Ving Rhames and Paul Walter Hauser, just an incredible, incredible cast. And it's pretty amusing. It's not a great movie. It's not even all that good a movie, but it's better than it should be. And I liked that some of the Boston footage was actually shot in Boston. Obviously, a lot of it not, but there's a there's a chase scene that happens like along the Charles. It's kind of good. Uh, there's, a, you know, just some shots of uh, of the ocean uh, in South Boston and, the, and that area. And so it actually looks like it was shot in a place and it's light and amusing and exactly the sort of, you know, 105 minute or so diversion that you want from a streaming movie starring uh, Matt Damon and Casey Affleck. Don't exactly recommend this as a great film, but you'll probably enjoy it. Uh, so I drove across the great state of Pennsylvania yesterday, and so I'm going to let Nick Gillespie tell you what I listened to. Uh, what 1980 double album I listened to on the way across the state of Pennsylvania that I hadn't listened to for 25 years. Nick, tell, tell everybody. I really was not paying attention, so <clears throat> you tell me about it. Sorry, I, somewhere wait, it, was it was somewhere it not, during Casey Affleck. I uh, did, but yeah, is it, it not uh, Tusk? Is it a Bob? Tusk is, is a, couple, a uh, couple years later, right? It's a Bruce uh, Springsteen I, record, right? About there the you go. See, I told about you about the Johnstown Company, uh, right? It, Matt, right. when you what happens when you uh, turn twenty one? Right. Uh, uh, that's right. You get, get, you get a, a union, union card, card and, and a wedding, a wedding coat. coat. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so I listened to The River uh, by Bruce Springsteen, his 1980 double uh, album, uh, which uh, used to be one of my favorite albums. And I just stopped listening to it at some point and figured, let's take it along the drive. And yes, OK, Boomer and midlife, you know, uh, 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 menopause crisis. Uh, but uh, wow, what an incredible uh, record. Um, just 20 songs, 19 of them are good to great. Uh, and uh, like total, like super aggro party rock energy on about half or more of the record and uh, rip your lungs out uh, type of uh, slower uh, ballads about just kind of getting disappointed in life and your adulthood and marriages breaking down and just insanely, insanely good. It's one of uh, the only like uh, rock albums that I think gets close to uh, literature, like a beggar's banquet from the Rolling Stones, I think is a piece of literature. I think the river is too. And I hate people who talk about Bree Springsteen and I, uh, and this, uh, arguably is the album that begins the problem of him taking himself too seriously. But since it's in the middle of like party rock, Bruce Springsteen, and like, I'm going to talk about the working man guy, but right in the middle and in his prime, just what a astonishingly great record. If you haven't listened to it in a long time and you ever used to like even some of the songs like the river or hungry heart or, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, stolen car, which is just incredibly uh, chilling and great. Uh, go give it another listen, especially if you're driving across the country. It's it's just terrific. Uh, Matt, did you check in at Williamsport, Pennsylvania? At did any not point. Not, 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 not enough time, enough? Uh, sadly. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I do warn the Peter Sudermans of the world that the original problem with the river, which is that it's really trebly. Because uh, it was all recorded in the same room live with the E Street Band, and it's lots of symbols. Um, it remains the problem. So if you don't, if you don't like records that don't have enough bass, um, you're gonna be in for some hurt. But just a, a terrific, crazy good record that'll hit you in a lot of. Uh, I don't know, man. I, I'm a big fan of uh, Metallica's Injustice for All, where they basically were so mad at the bass player that they were like, "You're gonna turn that off in the mix." Yeah. That's a, that's a surprise from a speakerhead. Uh, all right. Uh, that is all the time we have for speakerheads and other types of diversions on this podcast. Uh, if you like what we do, go to uh, reason.com uh, slash donate and, and help us pay for it. Uh, all of our podcasts, including the Reason interview with Nick Gillespie, uh, can be found over at reason.com slash podcast. Catherine, have we made you hype your event in September in which you're talking about the American dream or some such? Why don't you tell us about that? 
Sure. Uh, Tyler Cowan and I are going to be on the uh, pro side of Is the American Dream Alive? We will be debating some dirty socialists or something. And uh, (laughs) it's going to be fun. The Free Press is sponsoring it. And uh, it's in D.C. on September 10th. The tickets are already sold out. uh, But there will be video of the event as well later on. yeah, I'm going to I'm going to be my usual optimistic and cheerful self in the face of maybe hundreds of people in a room who all disagree. So stay tuned. That sounds really. So fun. is it is the American dream alive for robots? You know, I almost recommended one of my beach reads, which basically asked that question. But I I forbore. But the question, how are you going to argue really? in favor of the American dream when you don't believe in borders? Gosh, these are all really good questions, guys. Thank you for helping me prepare I'm for this. I'm sure you'll debate. be uh, hearing them on September 10th. Uh, all right. Uh, let's let's put a cap in it unless Nick has some burning event. But I think we're kind of I do right now. Oh, okay, I, I know, actually. I, I'm burning uh, in as many places as you were touched by the river, Matt Welch. Um, but uh, on September 11th in New York City, we have a Reason Speakeasy with Kat Timpf of uh, Fox News and the uh, Greg Gutfeld show in particular, uh, previous New York Times bestseller, has a new book out about how binary thinking uh, 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 puts us at odds with one another. And also tomorrow, I'm going to be doing a live stream uh, with Open to Debate, the former Intelligence Squared, where I'll be interviewing Brian Tyler Cohen, talking about political polarization in his new book, Shameless with a subtitle that is basically how the Republicans are evil. So it'll be a fun and uh, fun conversation about the sources of political polarization. Uh, and th- there'll be details somewhere. Uh, thanks to everyone for all the nice feedback about our last week's experiment crossover with dispatches, uh, Jonah Goldberg and Kevin Williamson. I think we might be doing similar experiments in the future. We might even have a weird guest next week to replace me. So stay tuned to the space to uh, hear more about that. All right. Thanks for listening and goodbye.